This is like uh, part two of Denise's message. She spoke last week on a little bit about compromise and choices we're making. Well, this is titled, A Lot of Compromise. And during this message, just to make sure that you, my church family, is staying awake, because it's a little bit long, is I'm going to say from time to time, can you say, and I want you to say, compromise. Okay? Yell it out. Loud, loud. So here we go. Let's practice. Can you say? That's right. All right? So the first scripture we're going to get into is 2 Peter 2, where Peter says, But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them. These are church people that Peter's talking, talking about. Bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their shameful ways and bring the way of truth into dispute. I want you to know we can do that in our own lives. Amen? It, it says, in their greed, there's things that we covet to. We sang in a song, I Surrender All, about the pleasures of the world. There's things that we cover in our, cover in our greed. And these, Peter says, these teachers will exploit you with stories they have made up. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. For if Elohim did not spare angels when, he, when they sinned, no, he didn't even spare the angels, but sent them to hell, putting them into gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world when he bought who brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others. Now, here the apostle Peter, again, is talking not to the wicked people of the world, but righteous in faith in Yeshua, church folks. Peter refers to the once righteous angels who fell and in sin, by following Satan's self-centered and covetous desires to take Yahweh's place, to be, you know, to have, the, look out for, for himself, number one, you know, and, and, and his thought process. And, and he talks, Peter brings up the once righteous descendants of Adam and Eve, who as people of the ancient pre-flood world, once had the truth of Yahweh, but forsook it for the lies that, and refuse to listen to the preaching of righteous Noah and were condemned. Paul says something similar in Romans 1. For the wrath of Elohim is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Can you say? All right, you're with me, you're with me. For what can be known about Elohim is plain to them. These people, they know. Uh, it's, you know yeah, it's plain to these people. Because Elohim was shown to them, or has shown. Yahweh himself showed to these people. These were people who Yahweh re revealed himself to. Church people. For his invisible attributes, namely, hallelujah, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived. It wasn't, it wasn't something that they were unclear about. Ever since the creation of the world, he, Yahweh, he's, Paul's talking about the people of the ancient world and, and the things that have been made. Hallelujah. So they are without excuse. For although they knew Elohim, they did not honor him as Elohim or give thanks to him. But they became futile, say futile, in their thinking. And their foolish hearts were darkened, claiming to be wise. They were dependent on their own ingenuity, on their own so-called cleverness, right? Claiming to be wise, they became what? And exchanged. They exchanged the glory of the immortal Elohim for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Can you say? That's right, that's right. They compromised the truth. Therefore, Elohim gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity 
to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about Elohim for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Can you say? Compromise. That's right, compromise. Amen. Does this sound like the world we live in today? Or should I go a step further and risk stepping on a few to toes by more accurately saying, does this sound and look like many sitting in the church? Right? Second Peter, let's go back to Second Peter 2, 6. He says, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by filthy lives of lawless men, for that righteous man lived among them day by day, was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trials and, how to, and to hold the unrighteous for the day of judgment while continuing their punishment. This is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desires. This is very important for us church folks. Those who follow the corrupt desires of the sinful nature and despise authority. Bold and arrogant, these men are not afraid to slander celestial beings. So speaking to righteous church people who know the Bible, Peter's references the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah and righteous Lot in warning these righteous church people against feeding into false teachings and corrupt fleshly desires or ways of thinking that Yahweh condemns. Yes, if you haven't already guessed, today we're going to talk about the life of a man named Lot, okay? That's why it's called a Lot of compromise. Amen? Pun, pun intended, all right? And see what we can learn from his relationship of contact with Yahweh. In fact, in looking at the lives of the people of the Bible, such as Lot, we often find some parallels between their strengths and weaknesses, their challenges and accomplishments, their fears and failures, and our own. It's good to be a smart person who learns from your own mistakes. But it's even better to be a wise person who also learns from the mistakes of others. Amen? It is good for us to examine what the scriptures have to say about the lives of people like Lot. For it will serve us well when in taking a glimpse at their, their lives, we also can glance at our own. Amen? The Bible is a mirror. It reflects back to us. Amen? Amen? When, when I studied Lot's story, the first word that came to my mind in describing him was compromise, you know? Yes, we can have faith that Yahweh can rescue us just like he rescued Lot and, and his family out of the immediate judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah. As scripture says, look at Joel 2, Yahweh says, I will restore to you the years that, swarming, that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper and, and the destroyer and the cutter. But guess what? He says that these locusts and stuff, he says, are my great army, which I sent among you. Why did he send them? He, he's telling Israel he can restore what the, what the locusts and the, and the cutter destroyed, and, you know. But who's the one that sent the locusts and the cutter? Yahweh. Because Israel was disobedient. Amen. Can you say? That's right. They were compromising the word of Yahweh. But, but we know in Romans 8 that Elohim works all things together, even our faults and our failures, for the good for those who what? Because you got to love them, right? If you don't love them, he don't work at all for good. And who, for those who are called according to whose purpose? Yes, not my own purpose, not me looking out for number one, right? Amen? So, like Lot, we could avoid a lot of unnecessary sacrifices and heartaches and hardship if we would only obey. Say obey. obey. 
the wisdom and commandment of Yahweh in the first place. Right? That's why in 1 Samuel 15, Samuel replied, What is more pleasing to Yahweh, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? Listen, Samuel says to Saul, obedience is better than sacrifice. And submission, say submission. submission. That's a bad word, a bad S word. Nobody likes that word, a cuss word, right? It's better than offering the fat of rams. Rather than giving all these offerings for, for your sins and everything, Yahweh would prefer you would just listen and obey him and submit to him in the first place rather than sinning. So when it came to obeying the wisdom and su submitting to, the, to some of the commandments of Yahweh, there were some decisions of compromise that righteous Lot made that put not only him, but his entire family in a bad way. Peter warns Yahweh's church family. Remember, they knew the Bible. They knew the story a lot, so they would be meditating, you know, uh, about Lot and the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, as they listened to Peter talk, you know. And, and, and when it comes to not compromising, you know, or following the corrupt desires and bad decisions that put us at risk, they would have been thinking about that. You know, the risk of suffering Yahweh's judgment. He just like what, what Lot and his family was. They were almost caught up in the judgment of Sodom, right? So, if you look at the dictionary, you'll find that the word compromise is used to describe a method of reaching agreement in a dispute by which each side surrenders something that it wants. In this way, compromise is used in a positive sense. However, the word compromise also is used to describe placing something in jeopardy or bringing into danger or exposing to a loss of reputation. In this way, compromise is used in a negative sense. For example, for instance, when a thief breaks into someone's home, we say that their security has been compromised. Everyone follow me? When I use compromise to describe Lot, I'm using it in the negative sense. In other words, I think that Lot is a man that placed many things in jeopardy in his life. Even though he is described by Peter as righteous. Because Peter is talking to righteous people. And let them know that righteous people can, make, can fall and make mistakes if they're not careful. There is... There is also evidence that this righteous man made some bad decisions in his life that compromised many areas of, of his life. And um, last week, Sister Denise spoke a lot, pun intended, about decisions and choices, right? Amen? That we make that will either bring us closer to Yahweh or lead us further away. And when we look at Lot's story, we see the process of of a life that starts out so well, but his life ended up badly as a result of a gradual process of a series of poor decisions and compromises, okay? And remember, as Denise said, that a decision we make will either bring us closer to Yahweh or lead us further away. And so, when, when Lot, when, what led Lot to compromise is the question we want to ask. Now, when we look at, at Lot... And, and his compromise or, or the placing things in jeopardy in his life. Before we do that, I think it's important for us to establish why or what led to Lot to compromise these things in his life. For, from the beginning, if you look at the life of Lot and the people around him, you'll find that not only he, but the important people in his life fostered a culture of compromise when it came to the commandments and leading of Yahweh. Part of what I mean when I mention important people around Lot is even the future father of faith, Abraham, who was then still referred to as Abram, and still very immature in his own faith, modeled compromise when it came to following the commands of Yahweh. Amen? And Lot was, grew up watching you know, Abraham was an elder in the family. 
Now, now, again, I'm not giving Lot excuses, but Lot had a, a lot of bad influence as far as important male leadership of the, over the family role modeling compromise in his life. Perhaps it was this exhibited family leadership patterns, you know, that promoted the negative compromise that contributed to a lot of Lot's decisions making and choices in life. So we are first introduced to Lot in the latter part of Genesis 11, where we learn that he is a grandson of a man named Terah. Terah is turned out, it turns out, is the father of Abraham, who would later be known as, again, Abraham, the father of Israel. And Terah had three sons, Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Lot is born to Haran. And in the same passage, we learn that Haran died fairly young. Now, Lot would have grown up watching the leadership of his grandfather, who was the patriarch of, of, of the family, Terah. Now, one of Lot's first journeys is recorded in the Bible. Genesis eleven thirty one. 31. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law, Sarai, the wife of his son, Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to where? That's Canaan, right? That's what they set out for. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Settled sounds a lot like, can you say? Right? Right? They settled here we see that Terah takes his family and heads out for Canaan. But do they reach their destination? No, they don't. They actually settled in Haran when they set out. Canaan was the, the original goal of their journeys in, but they didn't quite make it that far and ended up staying in another place named Haran, which just happened to be the namesake of Lot's father. Isn't that interesting? Hmm? Perhaps out of sentimentality for Lot's dead father, they compromised and settled for Haran. And, and starting in chapter 12, we find that Yahweh Elohim is calling Abraham out from under his father's head covering, out of the land of compromise, to continue on to the original destination, which was what? Canaan. How many know that though all of us are called to the promised land, when we see those who we love, those who we are a part of the same family or group or choosing to settle or compromise at some other place other than what Yahweh has revealed, we must not settle or compromise with them, but we must choose to continue on. Amen? It's natural to want to remain with those you love and consider family, but Yahweh's call should be, take precedence. So the Heavenly Father said to Abraham in Genesis 12, Yahweh said to Abraham, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham left as Yahweh had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. In essence, Abraham Leave, Yahweh is saying, Abraham, leave everything you know. Everyone you trust, even your firstborn rights, and follow me. He was to leave all, say all, all. behind everything that made him who he was. It's something that we all as followers of Yeshua have to learn. We have to strip ourselves of ourselves to get Yahweh's best. We must deny ourselves and pick up our crucifix, say goodbye to the old life and our old ways and the looking out for number one and follow Yeshua. It's just like 
seeing a little child whose parent is trying to teach them how to walk for the first time. The child is holding on desperately to the arm of the old familiar sofa that up to this point in his life, he has grown to depend on to use for support and balance. He was reaching with all his hand and all his might, you know, to grab the outstretched hand of his parent who stood nearby just beyond his grasp. But he just couldn't reach it unless, of course, he does what? Let's go of the safety of the old sofa arm, right? He'd grown accustomed to holding on to. So how often we say we want Father Yahweh's will in our life and all the while holding on to ours. Yet until we let go of our desires, our familiarity, and all that we expect to receive, how much can we truly expect from the Father? And this is where Abram was. He had to let go and move forward in that which the Father was calling him. But did he? Yes, well, sort of, right? Can you say? Right? Let's look at the Heavenly Father's command at him again, at Abram again. Genesis 12, 1. Remember, Abraham modeled this to Lot. Yahweh had said to Abraham, leave your country, your people, and your father's household and go to the land I will show you. So leave your country, check, said Abraham, right? Leave your people, check, all right? Leave your father's household, check. Uh, no, no check. Um, go to the land I will show you, check, right? Well, that's good. Can you say? I guess one could say that three out of four is not bad, right? You know? But I'm not sure that's how the father views obedience. There used to be a sign that Sister Eleanor put up here. I think it's downstairs now on the side of the wall. And it said that partial obedience is disobedience, Right? What did Abraham not do? Leave his father's household. Lot came along for the ride. Why, though? It's never indicated. But we can only speculate about why Abraham compromised and not fully leaving his father's household. It appears that Lot also detached from being a part of his grandfather's household and comes into the care of his uncle Abram. I imagine that young Lot may have witnessed this sort of conversation between his uncle Abram and the patriarch of the family, his grandfather. Uncle Abram may have said, sadly approached his grandfather and said, Dad, it's one of the hardest things I ever had to do. Yahweh, my God, has commanded me to leave my position as the firstborn inheritor of your household and all the responsibilities that come with that to go to the land that he will show me. Perhaps, perhaps after a lot, pun intended, of back and forth, Lot uh, observed his grandfather Terah respond to his uncle Abram in a very displeased state, saying, even if your God commands you to leave um, your responsibility as firstborn of this family, my son, the least you could do is to fulfill your obligation and, and, and see into the care of Lot, your dead brother Haran's son. And I imagine Lot witnessing his uncle Abraham agree, agreeing to this compromise, you know. And, and I don't know what he's thinking about it, but, he, you know, I'm going to be leaving too with, with Abraham as he's leaving the family. In Genesis 12, along with the famous call of Yahweh upon Abraham, where it says, he says, leave your country, your people, and your father's household and go to the land I will show you in Genesis 12. As if Lot was extra baggage that wasn't supposed to be a part of the original equation of who left with, with, with uh, Abram, who Abraham left with from his father's house. We read, recorded in verse 4, how when Abraham gets up to leave, Lot went with him. It is interesting to note that the next time we find Lot's name mentioned, the same third will impression is felt as it is mentioned using the exact same phrase in Genesis 13, 1. So Abraham went to, up, up from Egypt to the Negev, 
with his wife and everything he had, and Lot went with him. Right? It's a third will kind of feeling, you know? But up to this point, Abram and Lot appear inseparable. Lot, it seems, had a good relationship with his uncle and wasn't about to give that up. Besides how Lot might have been affected, I want to also look at how Abraham's model of compromise to Yahweh's command by taking Lot along affected Abram. So let's consider Genesis 13, 6. But the land could not support them while they stayed together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to stay together, and quarreling arose between Abram's herdsmen and the herdsmen of Lot. The Canaanites and Perizzites were also living in the land at that time. So Abram said to Lot, let's not have any quarreling between you and me, or between your herdsmen and mine, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you will go to the right, I'll go to the left. So Lot looked up and saw that the whole plain of Jordan was well watered, just like the garden of Yahweh, like the land of Egypt towards Zor. This was before Yahweh destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out towards the east. Now, it's interesting that the, the portion of land that Lot picked is compared with the Garden of Eden. And Lot moved east, say east. The opposite direction of Abraham, who was blessed by the Yahweh's presence as the father of faith. The, there was another who started out well until he decided to compromise when, when it came to burnt offerings unto Yahweh. And this man also departed east, away from the blessing of Yahweh's presence. Genesis 4.16, So Cain left Yahweh's presence and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Amen? So as we read on back to Genesis 13, Lot and Abram could not stay together. Abram then gave Lot the pick of the land. What did he choose? The best land. At least temporarily, Abram gave up what, that which was originally given to him by Yahweh, the best portion of it, all because of his own disobedience of compromise from the beginning. That's how this affected Abram. It appears as though Lot has got the better end of the deal, but then we find Later, that Lot himself eventually left the open land and moved into one of the neighboring cities, which eventually was destroyed. But what did he do with his flocks, his servants, his, the land? We don't know. One can't help but wonder if Lot compromised further by selling it all or to move into the city of Sodom. Perhaps he and his family were attracted to the city life. One thing is for sure. That that which was given to Abram was lost, at least momentarily, because of disobedience. The bottom line is, if you want your promised land, you can't take a lot with you. Amen? Pun intended. <laughs> we need to examine our lives today and see what lot you may be holding on to that's keeping us from all that Yahweh intends for us. We see Yahweh would eventually restore what Abraham gave away. But one big difference between the life of Abraham and, and righteous Lot is this. Lot's life of compromise led to the spiritual corruption and downfall of his family. Abram, who once compromised Yahweh's command for loyalty to family, matured into Abraham the father of many nations who put loyalty to, fa to Yahweh's command before family. Amen? Remember Jamie's message about Isaac's? Amen? Hallelujah. The two men parted company. Abram settled. The next verse, please. <laughs> they parted company and Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. 
Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against Yahweh. Yahweh said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, that's interesting, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the land that you see I will give to you and to your offspring forever. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted. Arise, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. So Abram moved his tent and came and settled by the oaks of Mamre, which are at Hebron, and there he built an altar to Yahweh. It's interesting that how the environment of Sodom where Lot chose to pitch his tent in is described by scripture as having men who were not just wicked, but were exceedingly, say exceedingly, wicked against Yahweh. And then Yahweh waits until immediately after Lot separated from Abram to, to inform Abram that in every direction, I imagine that Abraham a lot of sitting, was sitting on the, on the cliff and he said, look to the, over there, to, wherever you go, I'll go the opposite. Lot said, I'll go that way, and he left. And then Yahweh just comes and says, look, look. From the, he says, look in every direction, Abram. You know, uh, you know, he says, even the direction that, that you gave to Lot, basically, all the land will be given to you and your descendants. Later we learn that different from Lot and Sodom, Abraham did not compromise when it came to the environment that he kept his family in. As much as possible, Abraham kept his family separated from all that worldly wickedness and maintained a righteous environment. Say righteous environment. Uh, Sister Beth always talks about the importance of environment. A environment of keeping Yahweh's laws and statutes and commandments. We look at Genesis 18. Then the men set out from there. Those are the angels of Yahweh, the messengers. And they looked down up towards Sodom, and Abram sent with them um, to set them on their way. He went with them. And Yahweh said, Shall I hide from Abram what I am about to do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have chosen him. That he may command, say command, his children and his household after him to keep the way of Yahweh by doing righteousness and justice so that Yahweh may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. So as we continue on into chapter 14, we learn that Lot finds himself caught in the middle of an international war or conflict. As, as, as the enemies of, of, of Sodom and Gomorrah, are, you know, where Lot is staying, are, 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 are engaged in warfare. And some of the kings began warring in that area, and, and Lot and the people living with him, the Bible records, were carried off with all his possessions as captives of war. And Abram soon becomes aware of this and rushes into the rescue and, and, and miraculously defeats Lot's captors and freeing him as well as freeing all the other captives and their possessions. And the Bible is silent about Lot for a while after this. And then he is again mentioned in Genesis 19. But before Genesis 19, in chapter 18, we learned that Yahweh communicated with Abraham his intention to destroy the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah because of their wickedness. Abram, knowing his nephew Lot lives there, pleads with Yahweh and convinces Yahweh to spare the whole city if only 10, say 10, righteous people are found there. So when we go to, to read uh, Genesis 19, which you're not going to turn there, I'm just going to tell you, the answer is that there aren't even 10 righteous people to be found in the city of Sodom or Gomorrah Lot may have been the only righteous one because his family sure wasn't. There were lasting consequences to Lot's choices of compromise. It may be that the motivation behind righteous Lot's compromise was the desire for material wealth 
and prestige. Perhaps he fit in the category of those that Yeshua spoke about in Matthew 6, 24. Yeshua said, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve Elohim and money. I believe that trying to serve both Yahweh and material wealth was the compromise that led Lot's downfall toward his downward slide. Lot became rich off of Abraham's poor example of compromising Yahweh's command to leave his father's household behind and take Lot with him. So here we have the reason for the compromise in Lot's life. It began with bad role models. First, his grandpa Terah, they were supposed to go to Canaan. They settled in Iran. Then Abram, supposed to leave everybody, but he, you know, his father's household takes Lot. You know? So, so these, he had these bad role models in his life who simply looked out for number one by putting their own desires, will, and, des and decision-making before that of Father Yahweh's desires will, and decision for their lives. Oftentimes when a parent figure or a role model sins, your kids who are born with the cursed fleshly nature will more easily learn your bad habits than your good. And then what they'll do is they'll, some of them will even take your sin that you did to a higher level, a step further than even you do. Lot was so enamored with having prestige and material wealth that unlike Uncle Abram, who took care of him, he didn't even have the family loyalty for Abram that Abram had for him. Evidence of this is seen in his choice or decision to, at the resolution of the strife between Abraham and himself. Now we can look at what was compromised in, in Lot's life because of this. What Lot compromised was relationship with Abraham. One of the things you notice first about the story of Lot is his apparent closeness to his uncle Abraham. From the beginning, we learn how Lot went wherever his uncle went and his uncle willingly was willingness to have him along. But things seemed to change when their possessions increased, right? Lot became fat and rich and ran along with Abraham. Abraham was, was taking care of him. The thing that stands out about the character of Abraham at this point in, in Lot's life is his willingness to maintain his good relationship with his nephew and even put Lot's well-being before his own. Look at Genesis 13, 8, 9. So Abraham said to Lot, let's not have any quarreling between you and me or between your herdsmen and mine, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Abraham, Abram as his name was then, had every right to tell Lot where to go. He was the elder of the family and the one that Yahweh made the promise to. Abram risked everything by giving Lot the choice. Why? Because he was not willing to compromise his relationship with Lot. Clearly, Abram was, Abraham was not looking out for number one. Contrast this with Lot. He didn't even think twice about honoring the elder in the family who had cared for him all this time by letting him have the best of the land and its resources. Looking out for number one, Lot was willing to compromise his relationship with his uncle in order to take advantage of the apparent bonanza. The most unsettling thing that happens when we look out for number one is that we compromise our relationship with those who love us the most. Since Lot was acting like a spoiled childish little brat, we're going to let a little child's artwork illustrate our next point. <laughs> All right? Something that I think Lot forgot in his choice was that the only reason he had the possession he had in the first place 
was because he had hung around with Abraham, and Abram was blessed by Yahweh. Not only did Lot show disrespect for Yahweh's man by not offering his uncle Abram the best of the land and leaving Abraham, and leaving Abram, Lot was walking away from Yahweh's blessing. He was compromising or placing in jeopardy Yahweh's blessing. As Lot gave over, uh, as, as Lot gave over the less fertile, I mean, he, he gazed over the less fertile plain of Jordan, he saw the incredible opportunity to improve his place in the world, to improve his life, his way of life. Lot is the perfect example of how we as righteous followers of Yeshua can give into the fleshly human tendency to look out for number one. I know I'm not immune to the temptation myself, you know, but because this is a tendency of the flesh to be selfish. It's a fleshly childish tendency that we're all born with. A fleshly temptation that we must deny daily and unlearn through the Holy Spirit who gives us a way out by maturing us and following what Philippians 2, 3 says. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain deceit, conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Amen? I remember watching my wife, Denise, combat this fleshly tendency to look out for number one in our little kids who would fight over something they were supposed to share with one another. They fight I mean, the fight was always about who got the biggest, the best, or, or the most. It didn't matter if it was the last piece of cake, a single chocolate bar, or a slice of pizza. It would, it would never be split exactly in half, and it was always given that either one or the other would put up a big fight about getting the smaller half, even though the difference was insignificant, you know? And it would just drive Denise crazy. But one day, I observed my wife caught on to a neat idea that, one, that you might even try if you have little kids, okay? I mean, this is almost up there with the whole wisdom of Solomon cutting a baby in half that Pastor Jeremy spoke about in his last message. I mean, I, mean, this, I, 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 was, I looked at this and I was like, whoa, you know, Denise, Denise is, you know, is amazing, all right? And so what, this is what Denise did. Okay, Denise had the kids agree beforehand. Can you say? This is a positive way. He had them agree beforehand, all right, that one of them would split the ch chocolate bar or whatever in half, but the other person gets first choice of which half to take. Can you say again? That's right, the positive kind of compromise. Brilliant. Brilliant. Uh, all the days I heard Denise, you know, you're falling out, turning great prematurely, all because of these kids. I said, the, the woman has, is, is amazing, the wisdom. I don't know where she got it from. But it, it's, a, it's an excellent exa example of positive compromise, you know, to a simple childish problem. A solution was, was, was given. But is it childish? It seems that this characteristic doesn't disappear as we grow older. We just learn to become more civilized, or some of us, right? It is still in our nature as humans, even adults, to look out for number one, right? In our fleshly nature that we must die to. Lot's behavior in, in looking out for number one manifested itself in many ways. Number one, it blinded him to the dangers of Sodom, you know? When it came to making decisions, Lot went with what appealed mostly to his earthly appetites and was blind to the dangers of Sodom. In other words, Lot saw what was best for him in the world rather than what was worse for his spirit. When he looked out at the, ver the fertile valley of the Jordan Plain, Lot saw only how he could potentially increase his possessions in this world instead of the spiritual dangers found in the cities of the plain. It would be naive to think that Lot was not aware of the spiritual depravity in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Abram and Lot had been in the area for a while and would have had news of the area. 
Yet, in spite of this knowledge, Lot still chose the way he did. In fact, we find that Lot first pitched his tent near Sodom and then eventually lived in the city. Maybe he thought he would be immune to the corruption found in the city. Maybe he thought he could influence it for good. Instead, Lot ended up compromising everything in his life because of his choice. Lot's behavior in looking out for number one also caused him to trust in his own ways rather than Yahweh's ways. It's interesting to note that Lot didn't once consult Yahweh about his choice. Even after seeing how Yahweh directed the life of Abraham, Lot had his own plans and failed to consult Yahweh. After being caught in, his, in an international conflict and being miraculously rescued by his uncle Abram, you would think Lot would have got the picture and said to himself, maybe I made a bad decision in moving here. But no! Instead, he sold his tents and bought a condo in the city. It says in Genesis 19.1 that when the angels of, uh, came to Lot, it, Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. Okay? So we see that, and, and one of the things is perhaps it was the lure of more prestige and wealth that led Lot to seek to participate in the politics of Sodom. He became a leader, because that's, in the ancient world, the, the leaders of a city would sit in the gate and judge the people. Okay? And so, and so Lot sat in the gate of the city of Sodom because that was a leader's job, to sit in there as judge. Now, and the next thing we know is that when the angels came to the city of Sodom, Lot knew who they were. But in spite of that knowledge, he still tried to get out of the jam he found himself in when the mob came to the door demanding to be... To, that he would deliver his guests, his, you know, the new visitors to the city, to be sexually molested. Instead of shutting the door of the mob's face and trusting Yahweh would somehow work out a solution with his powerful angels, what did Lot do? Can you say? That's right. Lot took things into his own hand and diplomatically, he played politics or tried to, tried to come up, hallelujah, with a compromise by calling the crowd his friends and offered them his two virgin daughters instead, right? Now, we're not going to turn there, but Second Chronicles 32, King Hezekiah and Isaiah said a prayer, and Yahweh sent only one angel who annihilated the entire army of mighty men and, and, and of valor and leaders in, in the king of Assyria's army just by himself. Just one angel. Lot had two. Right? But he was so in the habit of depending on his own power of compromise to handle things that he was willing to sacrifice his own two virgin daughters. What father in the right mind would do such a thing? Yet for Lot... Looking out for number one meant he'd formed a fatal habit, a way of life that involved trusting in his own ways and solutions rather than Yahweh's ways. This was the old familiar road of compromise that Lot had witnessed growing up and had forged and trusted in his, his own way of life. Ultimately, compromise even intruded upon how he related to the Heavenly Father and defined the way in which he followed Elohim's instructions towards the salvation of both he and his family. Look at this in Genesis 19. As morning dawned, the angels, the angels of Yahweh urged Lot, saying, Up! Take your wife! And your two daughters who are here, lest you be swept away in the punishment of the city. The angels knew that, 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 that Yahweh was about to, to firebomb the city, right? But guess what Lot did? Can you say? But he lingered. So the men seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand. The angels had to grab him and pull him out of the city. Yahweh being merciful to him. And they brought him out and set him outside the city. 
Even when the angels miraculously delivered Lot from the crowd of the, of, the, of the men that wanted to sodomize the angels by making them blind and told Lot, y'all always planned to destroy the city, uh, you know, the scriptures record that he hesitated when it was time to go. And the angels, I mean, just, could you imagine? I mean, he had to physically pull him out. That shows you that the addiction of the city, the desire, the, the attachment was so strong in Lot's life and his wife and his daughter's lives also. The angels had to remove them physically from the city. Then while in route, Lot, guess what? He pleaded with the angels to let him go to the small city of Zoar rather than the mountain that Yahweh wanted him to go. Sounds like what, what, what uh, grandfather Terah did. He was supposed to go to Canaan, but they went somewhere else instead. They settled for something else. He's, can you say, <laughs> Lot trusted in his own ways rather than Yahweh's ways because his habit or pattern of life was always looking out for number one. As you read to the, to the conclusion of Lot's life, you see that the impact and that his decision had on his life. Again, Peter writes in, in 2 Peter 2, and if he rescued Lot, we, you know, he can rescue you guys, right? Righteous, a righteous man who was distressed by the filthy lives of lawless men. For that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. Why was Lot so tormented in the city of Sodom? Because he had known what it meant to be in Yahweh's blessing among righteous commandment-keeping people such as Uncle Abram and his family. Amen? It is so true that when those who have known the blessing of Yahweh's compromise, Yahweh compromised that for the, the passing pleasures of the world, those pleasures become a torment rather than a joy. Amen? Instead of just choosing one side, trying to compromise by having the best of both worlds will lead to vexation of one's soul. Nothing compares with the unadulterated presence, let me get an amen, of Yahweh. No matter how appealing the desires of this world may seem, nothing can compare. Amen? So we look at Lot's immediate family, how, how it's affected. Probably one of the saddest things that, that happened as a result of Lot's decision was the placing in jeopardy of his family. Notice what happened as a result of Lot's compromise. The very safety of his family was compromised in the midst of the, the international war conflict. The other thing, his virgin daughters were engaged to son-in-laws who refused to leave with him when he warns them of the impending destruction of Sodom. In fact, they laughed at Lot. You know, with look, they had that same looking out for number one mentality. They had many things that they liked about the atmosphere in Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and they had no b belief in their father-in-law's faith nor his knowledge of Yahweh. Because Lot was right there with them the whole time. So they, his light wasn't shining as brightly. Lot's son-in-laws had become accustomed to the wickedness of Sodom. Instead of following the command of Elohim's angels, Lot's own wife rebels against the word of, of Yahweh's angels and with desire looks back at Sodom after being warned not to. She is turned into a pillar of salt. She looked back with longing heart for what she was leaving behind and not believing that the city really was going to be destroyed. Yeshua uses Lot's wife as a negative example. We see here in Luke 17, says, Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking and buying and selling. Yeshua was talking about the last days. Planning and building. But on the day when Lot went out of Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. So will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, let the one who is on the housetop with his goods in the house not come down to take them away. And likewise, let the one who is in the field not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. That's what Yeshua says. Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life 
We'll keep it. Amen? Do we, is this a lesson we need to learn today, brothers and sisters? Last but not least, instead of trusting Yahweh and accepting nothing less than his best, Lot's remaining daughters end up getting him drunk and committing incest with him in a cave on the mountain of refuge at the end of Lot's story. You'll see that, remember, they stayed in Zoar. They didn't want to go to the, to the mountain of refuge at first. The angel told them to go. They, he, Lot convinced them to go to Zoar. But um, I guess after some point, they didn't feel safe in Zoar because they probably saw some of the same wickedness in Zoar. So they eventually on their own went after the fact to the mountain of refuge and stayed in a cave. All right? And so... Lot's wife, uh, daughters, they, they, probably, they didn't see no men around. They, they gave up hope of having any men. Not, that's not an excuse. But Lot's daughters, virgin daughters, they, they're growing up having been exposed to the compromise of their father and the wickedness of the city of Sodom for most of their lives. You know, they, they were, had become widows before they were even married to Lot's son-in-laws because they, their son-in-law perished in, in, in Sodom. These, these daughters feared that they would never find proper husbands and settled for an incestuous compromise. Can you say? They, they took on the prevailing family mentality of looking out for number one. And they minimized the breaking of Yahweh's commandment against incest, for they obviously viewed as a much more important goal the desire to have children and make a family of their own. Right? That was, that was more important to them than, than, you know, keeping Yahweh's command. So how many of the church have, instead of trusting Yahweh, willingly compromised the revealed truth of Yahweh's word and s sinned in order to be with, a mar or be with or marry a man or woman that was outside of the will of Yahweh for them to be with? We're talking about integrity. Folks, integrity to the word of Yahweh, faithfulness to his word. Yahweh's going to hold us accountable. Ultimately, Lot also compromised his integrity as a professed follower of Yahweh. His own set of laws laughed at him when he tried to warn them about sin, about Sodom. The mob at, the, at Lot's door mocked him when he tried to resolve things. He says, you want to be a judge among us? By offering his own daughters... He, he tried to resolve the issue. And looking out for number one, Lot compromised who he was and what he was supposed to stand for as a follower of Yahweh. So here's the conclusion. What is it about Lot's life that should serve as example for us of what not to do? We need to know our weakness. Amen? It says here, let him that thinketh he standeth Take heed lest he fall, in 1 Corinthians 10. From Lot, we learn of the incredible danger inherent in, in looking out for number one. Lot was willing to compromise Yahweh's ways in, in order to obtain prestige and material wealth for his family, but he ended up losing everything. How far, let me ask you a question, how far can a Christian backslide and compromise and still be called righteous by Yahweh. Lot lost his money. He lost his home. He lost his leadership position in the city of Sodom. He lost his wife to covetous compromise of a salty death, right? I almost laughed. But he lost his... I shouldn't laugh. It's not funny. But he lost his daughters as righteous virgins before Yahweh to incest with himself. Lot didn't help Sodom. Lot believes, I mean, I mean, let me ask you a question. Can believers help the unsaved by living in the compromise of sin? Abraham did more for Sodom by being separated from Sodom than Lot did by entering Sodom. Yahweh had to take the initiative. In other words, can you compromise with the world, then plan to return to Yahweh? No, not without Yahweh. Not without his help. Without Yeshua, what can, what can, can we, do? we could do what? Nothing, right? Lot had to be dragged from the city without, you know, amen? Because it says, without Yeshua, it's impossible for backsliders 
to take the initiative and to redeem themselves. Amen? The decisions reached by Abram and Lot are the same as those which confront every one of us, brothers and sisters, every Christian out there. We must decide whether to grow up spiritually by trusting in the sovereignty of Yahweh Elohim or to stay under the influence of our own fleshly schemes and devices. Remember, by, trust, by, 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 by professing to be wise, they showed themselves to be fools, Paul said, right? We must determine whether to trust in the uncertainty of riches or in the Elohim who richly supplies us as it says in 1 Timothy. We must decide whether to invest in the passing pleasures of sin or the, or the future reward which is promised by Yahweh Elohim, as it, as it talks about in Hebrews chapter 11. The world's way of getting ahead is looking out for number one. That was Lot's way as well, and his family adopted that too in Sodom. Yahweh's way of blessing is looking up to number one. Amen? And looking out for others. Amen? Matthew 22. Yeshua replied, Love Yahweh, your Elohim, with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandments. And the second is like to it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Amen? Such a life can only be lived by faith. An uncompromising faith. Such a life can only cause our faith in Yahweh to grow. Trying to compromise by having the best of both worlds halts our spiritual growth and ultimately leads to vexation and despair. The beginning point for every man, woman, and child is to look to Yahweh for salvation. We cannot, we dare not trust in our own shrewdness, our own wisdom, cleverness, to get us entrance into Elohim's kingdom. Often what we perceive to be paradise, Lot and his, and his family, they thought, Lot, they thought Sodom and Gomorrah was the place to be. Often what we perceive to be paradise is soon to be destroyed by divine wrath. Faith recognizes our sinfulness and trust in the work of Yeshua the Messiah on Calvary's tree alone, amen, for eternal security and blessing. Our own best efforts are doomed to destruction. Only what Yahweh promises and his provided righteous commandments for living will endure. As we saw with the life of Lot, even the righteous can make mistakes and fall. But we can avoid compromising as Lot did by daily denying ourselves, embracing the righteous life of Messiah in us, the hope of glory. Although we still may experience the consequences of, of bad decisions of the past, Yahweh still extends the gra his grace and his mercies. He will restore the years that the, the, the canker worm has, and the locusts have eaten, right? Amen. He will still he provide salvation for us. Amen. To those who repent and receive it. Yahweh bless.